up, everybody? Welcome to the CRE Arena. Uh, this is a podcast where we get on, we talk about commercial real estate and business and entrepreneurship and life. Uh, and the goal of this podcast is really to help the listener become more effective in their commercial real estate career or just become more knowledgeable and uh, help them find success in whatever it is they set out to do. So today we have Andrew Bermudez, who is the founder and CEO of Digsy. And it's a prop tech company. He's, I, I, he will explain it much better than I can. But uh, really exciting stuff he's doing in the commercial real estate industry. Um, so, Andrew, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me, man. It's good to connect. We've been uh, connecting for quite a bit on social yeah. media. So it's good to put a face with a name. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, man, social has been a great – it's been such a great spot to – meet so many awesome people and see what they're doing and see who's, you know, moving and shaking in the, in the business, which, um, you know, that's one thing I talk to young brokers about all the time is, you know, the use of social media because it can be misused and, uh, but there are some really, really good things for it. And this is one of them, you know, meeting great people like yourself and getting to learn your story and, you know, uh, thoughts on the commercial real estate industry. So, uh, well, once again, man, thanks so much for coming on. And I just like to start out and say, you know, Hey, you know, how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, so um, my dirty secret is before I started in commercial real estate, I started pretty young. I started, I think I was 19 or 20. That was back yeah. in 1999. Um, I was a self-taught programmer. Uh, so I kind of got went into commercial real estate simply because I got to put myself through college and my parents didn't have money. So I ended up at Lee and Associates in Irvine. Irvine's the first office that Bill Lee opened. And I was there from 99 to 2012. Uh, and I quickly rose up the ranks, became vice president at 24. That means partner, so we have shares and split the profits at the end of the year. Uh, and then a year and a half later, I became senior vice president. And I ran a team. Uh, I hired a lot of people there. So there's, you know, about all the partners that I hired, they're all partners over there now, like vice presidents and senior vice presidents. Uh, but it wasn't always rosy. Like, I had to learn a lot in, like, hiring people, training people, and having systems. My dirty secret on how I rose so fast was because I was a self-taught programmer, uh, you know, when you start a commercial real estate, you make a bunch of cold calls and then you're trying yeah. to generate leads. And I'm, the internet wasn't in, in its infancy, right? In 99, you had the dot com thing. And I'm like, hey, man, a lot of people are searching online. Why don't I just do that? And also, why don't I really focus on collecting emails and do email marketing? Back then, you wouldn't see an email blast with a picture, like a brochure email blast. And I knew how yeah. to do that. So I would do that. And then people would inquire, hey, that space is too big for me to do this. So I was like basically not only making cold calls, but I was doing email marketing and, and, and internet uh, marketing. And if you remember back in 99, uh, to buy a Google ad was like pennies, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now it's a lot more expensive. I mean, you, if you're in commercial real estate, you probably pay anywhere from six bucks to 20 bucks a click now. Yeah. But that's I've, how I got I've, into it. I've heard war stories, but I was five. So, um, so I wasn't... Uh... I, I got on the, the computer to play video games and had the, you know, the dial up connection that was like screaming at you. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> I'm, just trying, I'm just trying to get to my dirt bike game. That was about my extent of knowledge in 99. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. So I was a little bit out of the womb much, uh, many years before you. Right. Right. But, so I did that. And then in 2012, so I, because I started in 99, a lot of my clients, and I started off in Office and Flex, a lot of my clients were internet uh, companies and tech companies. Oh, that's cool. Um, and I always had an affinity for it, having been a programmer, I was just much of a nerd. And uh, a lot of my clients, like because of who they were, they had raised millions, they, companies had gone bankrupt, or they became angel investors, or they became venture capitalists. And we would always hang out. Even my clients, I did a lot of stuff around tech. Even my clients, like we go and talk real estate for like five minutes, but then we start talking about their business, et cetera. They're like, dude, you're not a real estate guy. Like, why don't you go start your own tech company on this? And, you know, hmm. that was told to me since like, you know, I started, yeah. uh, but I just didn't know. I didn't know what to yeah. do or anything like that. And also I was scared. So yeah. it took me, so I finally, you know, decided to strap some on and uh, in 2012, I decided to leave and go start something. I had made enough money where I had, you know, money in the bank and I could take some risks and I did that and started two businesses, didn't go anywhere uh, on the tech side. And then Digsy, we started about seven years ago and that's gone through its evolution too. Uh, so we started off basically as just a free listing service. Real, right, real, real, quick, real quick, before you get into Digsy, what were the two failed ventures? Because I, I love to hear failure stories too. And I think, yeah. uh, I think so those, aren't, first, those aren't talked about enough because people yeah. you know, don't have success and then they're like, I'm a failure or whatever. You know, so um, yeah, man, if, if you don't mind sharing, what are, the, what are the two failures that you, you know, learning 
uh, the learning curves that you went through. Yeah. Uh, so I had started this uh, website and email blasting service called Broker Roster. So what we would do is we would uh, scrape and call the brokerage offices all over the U.S. and basically get a database of brokers and their expertise with, or their specialization, whether it was investments, multifamily, or if it was industrial, or if it was tenant rep, if it was R&D, et cetera. And then what we could do is people could go in and instead of posting a listing, they could post a requirement. Mm -hmm. Like I'm looking for a $12 million property, et cetera. And they would post it. So now it's in the database where people can search, mm -hmm. but then they could blast it out. So okay. it became pretty viral in that sense because you'd receive them like, hey, what's this broker roster stuff that everybody's using? Yeah. And we had clients that were closing like $12 million deals. They were, wow. you know, it was working pretty well. Yeah. But it just didn't work. The, 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 the number of people posting requirements wasn't a lot. A lot of people like to keep that information close to the vest. Not everybody works on an exclusive basis. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, man, you know, when you're on the listing side, you get so many inquiries, et cetera. No matter how much you want to lease or sell the building, unless there's like a really critical urgency where you're going to lose the listing, you just wait for somebody to come to you versus you going an offense. So. Mm -hmm. Basically, market size is a reason why it did it. Market size and then um, consistency of like of usage, right? Yeah. Uh, we had people would use it daily, but if you grab the number of people that use it daily and the number of people that there's, you know, uh, of that of that uh, total addressable market, it was too small. Yeah. Uh, and then the second one was we had tried to create uh, a tool to. Uh, to make it very, very easy to calculate effective rents, right? Uh, so as opposed to using a spreadsheet, you can just pop things in really quick and then it would spit out, here's the net effective rent, here's what they're paying per month, et cetera. And the, you most, like if you're doing tenant rep or if you're on the listing side, like if you're on the listing side, maybe you're doing like a 30 to 100 deals if you're in a smaller team. But yeah. tenant rep brokers usually do anywhere between, you know, maybe five to 12 deals a year. So again, market size and the, the, the volume that you need for usage wasn't there. So there was no way to monetize it. Gotcha. And, and then real quick, for, before we get on to Digsy, for both of those ventures, was it like, hey, you had the, like you saw it was, you know, kind of fizzled or it wasn't exactly what you thought. And then you, you know, had, you, you had a new idea and then started to run with that. Or was there like a... Was it more of a, I don't want to say crash and burn, was it more harsh in a sense of like, hey, we're not making any money, we got to shut this thing down? I guess it was a combination. Um, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say, it, well, it didn't crash and burn, it just became yeah. very evident pretty quickly as I was learning from investors and mentors and other entrepreneurs that I was talking to, Yeah. that as we saw, even, even some false signals were like, it seemed promising, once you really did the total addressable market and then you saw the like the the propensity of the usage that it became like this is like a vanity project it's not something that you're going to build a multi-million dollar business or a billion dollar business off of mm -hmm. and then how long last question on these before we move on but how long did you take to uh to like size that total addressable market was it you know did you have like hey we you know, hit it for three years, four years, five years, or it was, was it, it was 12, 18 months and say, Hey, 12, it was 12, 18 months. And that's okay. built both those projects together. Oh, wow. I did wow. one and then I did the other one, but all together it would have been like, maybe like eight months, maybe wow. nine months per project. Yeah. yeah that's like quick. So um, yeah, it has but, to be quick. Otherwise you run out of money and then you're out on the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, failing fast, uh, getting to a no or failing fast is, is a good I'd thing. I'd rather get a no than keep calling. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, so, so, and then when those ended, you started Digsy. And then what year was that? And then, yeah, if you can tell us what, what Digsy is about. Yeah, so uh, Digsy was 2016, I want to say. Yeah, 2016. Yeah, 2016. Um, so it, w it was a while. It was probably about a year, year and a half. Um, after I put those to bed to kind of like, re like figure out what to do. Yeah. Um, so long story short, I had met some of the guys that founded Digsy or founded LoopNet. They had sold it to Coastal back in 2012. This is in 2015. 
And uh, they had told me that the plan was to do X, Y, and Z, which was going to cause them to lose a lot of listings, but it was also going to get really expensive. Mm -hmm. So we said, hey, what better way than to like just start a free one now? There's a lot of listing services out there. There's like 50 listing services out there, and there's like only like 10 that people know about. Yeah. Um, I had met one of the board members of Zillow. And, you know, I was pitching him to get money from him, but uh, he also shared a lot of the business with me. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. So if we make the free service, you know, people are already paying for like the major listing services, which, you know, cost a significant amount of money. Right. So for a new entrant to come in and be able to charge is going to be hard. However, Zillow just doesn't charge anything. The way that Zillow makes money is because they're getting all those people searching for homes, then what they do is they refer those people out to brokers. So that was our business model to start with is we would, you know, we rank on the first page of Google if you're searching to buy a building or a building for lease or for sale, whether it's multifamily, office, industrial, retail, et cetera. It ranks on the first page of Google. You can search everything for free. You can contact the listing brokers for free. But we're collecting a lot of damn data mm -hmm. and that we know who those people are. So imagine you as a broker knowing in your market, these are the people actively looking for real estate. Yeah. Right. That's very powerful. Yeah. But you can't just sell that entire data set, right? So yeah. the, the being able to refer those deals out or having somebody pay a subscription to do it, then, then you do it uh, there. So we probably went about a year and a half doing that model. And then we basically realized that when you have a listing service like that, uh, there's, two, there's, there's two main people who, who search for on a, uh, on, online. One, it's an investor. So you know, less than 5% of searchers are buyers. And they're like on the top end, right? Yeah. But that 5% means there's a lot fewer of them. Mm -hmm. And then 80% of them are like sub 5,000 square feet. Like most of them are like around 1,000 yeah. square feet to 3,000 yeah. square feet for lease. Right. Right. So if you look in that, and it took us about a year and a half to two years actually to realize that the Zillow model wasn't going to work because most brokers don't want to work on a, on a sub 5,000 square foot deal, even a 5,000 square foot deal. If you look at it, you know, you're looking at, ha you know, $300,000, $500,000 in consideration mm -hmm. and you're making, you know, 3% or 2% or whatever, 4% mm -hmm. of your office. But the problem is then you got to split that with a house. So with a majority being leasing, when you're searching on, on, on Zillow, you know, depending on the market, let's just say this was years ago, but $300,000 home or a most, in most places like, for example, California, Washington, everything, everything's like close to a million. That's a hefty commission per searcher. Right. Now imagine if you chop that to 95% of searchers are not that, they're not gonna bring you that model. So that model didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, it does work for people who are in tertiary markets who do office industrial retail and they gotta you know, do a bunch of deals. But a right. CBRE broker is not gonna touch that, et cetera. So that right. became apparent, so what we started doing is creating tools around, hey, we have this listing service. People would love to embed, you know, the listings on their site to show all the listings in the market. You still show the listing broker, but then when they, they can contact you and then have like little lead capture tools that you can use online, et cetera. And we did that. Uh, people were attracted to it. The problem is as a broker, you got so many things to do. So it was hard. I mean, it wasn't hard selling it. What was hard is retaining the customer. Because okay. after six months, they'd be like, hey, this is great, but I just don't have time to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they cancel. And that's terrible, right? Yeah. So then we basically had to pivot to other things. So that we, uh, then what we did is when the pandemic hit, we realized that people would need to get more pictures and virtual tours. But the problem is to get a virtual tour, you don't know where to go. And it's expensive. It's like 17 cents, 15 cents a foot. So we looked into this problem. And then we basically made Digsy, hey, one-stop shop, you're going to list your property, you need photos, you need virtual tours, and maybe a mar marketing video, you can get it through Digsy, 30 to 50% cheaper, you don't have to go find somebody, you don't have to worry about quality control, Digsy handles it. So we built a network mm -hmm. of photographers and these Matterport people, et cetera, uh, throughout the US and Canada, and we built that out. And then what we found out is a combination, so we started getting a lot of business from that. Um, the brokerages and also the individual agents. And then what we noticed was a lot of people wanted to see, like use a lot of the tools that the listing service has for lead yeah. generation. They just don't have time to do it. So we ran a project where we basically say, well, what, what, why don't we do the work for you? 
right? So we started off using our own tools uh, and then retention went up and then we were making more money because what we were doing is basically we've always had a um, we've always had an operation in the Philippines to do a lot of the data entry, a lot of our sales, outbound sales, cold calling, et cetera, is done by people in the Philippines who speak great English, work U.S. hours, and that was working. So we basically took that and said, okay, well, let's grab one of our marketers and one of our cold callers to do this for the broker. We know, because we're in commercial real estate, we know what questions to ask, how to write the scripts. The client doesn't have to interview. The client doesn't have to train. They don't have to write operating procedures. It's just fully turnkey. Yeah. And then what happened is here's the photography business and, and, and the virtual tours. And then we introduce like the muscle, basically like, how do you get all this stuff out in the market? And then basically it just went like crazy. Yeah. So we're like a turnkey staffing company where like brokerages will use us, right? Yeah. So the marketing person has left. They need somebody to do OMs, brochures, et cetera. They hire Digsy. We do everything for them. You know, they have an SVN email address. They have, a, like for example, SVN uh, Vanguard. Uh, Cameron Irons, who has those four offices in, in California, two of them are open, San Diego, Santa Ana, and then two or three other ones that he's opening up. All their social media marketing, it's branded under, under them, but it's a Digsy marketing person that's dedicated to his account. I they see. work under SVN, but basically they don't have to pay payroll taxes, they don't have to train, they don't have to manage them. We run everything. Yeah. So it's basically like almost like having a turnkey situation. Yeah. Uh, and same thing like for recruiting, right? Like some of these brokerages, um, they don't want to, I mean, the managing directors don't, they want to attract more agents. So they have a Digsy person that's basically calling on brokers to recruit them over there. And then you have the individual brokers who want us to, you know, cold call tenants or cold call uh, building owners if they want to lease, if they have an assumable loan, if they want to do that. And these guys on a part time basis are generally like two to three leads a week. Yeah. Right. So it's worked out pretty well. And then we have brokerages. Uh, I can't name these names because we have confidentiality agreements, but uh, basically they've lost or they need additional help and, you know, typing, you know, PSAs or LOIs or proposals or sales comparables. They have somebody at Digsy that knows how to do all the stuff dedicated to them. And then they're typing the proposals or doing the, uh, the lease agreements or doing all that stuff. And yeah. then the same thing goes for like marketing. So basically it's a very easy way to not have to like spend three months trying to find somebody interviewing five to 10 people for five to 10 hours and then hiring them and then training them because commercial real estate is so niche. You have been able to say, Hey, I can get somebody up and running with Digsy in as little as 14 business days and they're already trained yeah. and all they do, I just meet with them and just, you know, we customize things because everybody does the same thing, but they do it differently. Yeah. And then what ends up happening is now the brokerage is our client and the individual agents in the company is our client. And then we're using our software and we're using different tools. And we also use the client's tools as well, right, uh, to do all that stuff. And guess how much it costs? So if you were trying to get somebody to top up LOIs today, you're going to pay in today's market and, and climate, you're going to pay $80,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at spending $7,000 a month, some change. Mm -hmm. And that's before FICA, payroll benefits, et cetera. Uh, we're able to produce the same person, even better, fifteen dollars an hour, so twenty four hundred dollars a month for part for full time, or twelve hundred bucks for part time. Wow, no, that's that's impressive, man. And I think you're you're filling a void in the market. And uh, and when you said NDAs and you were talking about you know replacing people, what popped in my head was I said I, I thought. Uh, you know, there's, uh, it's like, you know who you are. Uh, there's, there's some pretty big headlines of big corporate brokerages and, and lay layoffs in the four and five figures. Um, you know, as things started to tighten up, uh, you know, there was a lot of, I just think uncertainty in the market. So, you know, I saw, you know, some of the bigger corporate brokerages lay off people, like I said, by the thousands. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, all those people, you know, came to work every day and, you know, did and did, they had a task, they had a job to do. So, uh, a service like you are providing, I think that's very valuable in that sense, and you know helps streamline things. But also, I think it really it helps it helps the people involved at the brokerage, you know, be focused on brokerage because, like, you know, the marketing, you know, the marketing, the automations, the uh, the LOIs, you know, all of these things, uh, you know, they have to get done, and they're part of the business. Yeah. But you know, the real the real craft of of, of sales, and and you know, training 
training younger brokers, bringing people up in the business, uh, you know, how to provide the best results for the clients. Like that's not, it's a, it's, it's a, you know, it's a deep learning process and takes a long time and you have to, you have to, you know, give those younger brokers attention. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why we started CRE Academy was because, um, you know, I think there's a lack of training in the industry, uh, but it makes perfect sense because the people that know how to do the thing, uh, they can make a ton of money of, you know, for actually doing the thing and, you know, teaching the thing was, was not that lucrative, uh, or, or just helping out younger advisors. So I've been very grateful because I've had a, a few good mentors, um, here at SVN and, you know, they've done a really good job with bringing me up in the business, but, you know, uh, I, I think your service helping, helping the people at the firm keep, you know, focused on the main things and keep the main things, the main things, uh, and what really drives, you know, revenue and business within a commercial brokerage, which is sales. Um, so that's, that's really cool, man. Yeah. It's kind of funny how, how it evolved because we started with the listing service and we added photography nationwide. And then now we added the muscle basically to help people run and grow the business. So now what we do is we call it an online, uh, a one-stop shop for commercial real estate professionals, right? You need visuals for your marketing, get it here. You want to, you know, also get it exposed on Google, listed on the same platform. You need somebody to help you market or cold call or return, you know, update prospect reports or do anything like that. Or you need a marketing person or a graphics person or you need or you need like an admin person. I can get in the same place. So it's it's kind of interesting how we just started with just tech, but then we realized that because brokers are so busy, brokers are busy because brokerage, it's not like a McDonald's, right? Where one person takes the order, another person assembles a burger, another person works the front desk, right? It's uh, brokerage is like the one man, the one woman McDonald's. Somebody, that same person's taking the order, putting the burger, and then doing everything else. And that means that that order takes a lot, a lot more time. But it only means I can only support X amount of customers because I only have X number of hours. Right. Right. So that's what we realized is like, okay, we can do the tech to make them more efficient, but they're so busy taking orders and touring buildings and doing things that like by the time they free up, they don't have that time. So if we were able to throw trained labor in that, that we manage, that we monitor, that basically you're hiring Digsy, you're not hiring essentially like a virtual assistant or anything like that. You're hiring us. We just assign you somebody from our team. Now, Now you're able to, hey, I'm out touring buildings, but you know, my Digsy assistant just texted me that this guy wants to sell his $5 million property. So you're able right. to use a, a combination of tech and muscle to help retain the customers that are buying the tech, or even if they're not buying the tech, they've bought other tech, or yeah. they just need help, you know, doing something that they just don't have the time to do. And we've been very successful with it. Yeah, no, man, that's awesome. And uh, I got a question on operations here in a second, but I think what you're saying about the one-stop shop McDonald's, that's, uh, that's, it, it makes total sense. And that was, you know, something I share with a lot of our, our members is that, you know, so I developed something about two and a half years ago called the brokers continuum. And pretty much I would, you know, it came about because I was doing emails. I remember I was doing emails and phone calls for like, it was like three days straight. And I remember from like eight thirty AM to like 5 PM and, you know, hash out my emails by 1030 and then get a phone call, get on a phone call for 20, 30, 40 minutes, you know, two or three more emails came in. Then I'd respond to those. And I did that for like three days straight. And I was like, I just sat there and thought, I was like, I don't think I spent one hour on my business and like even yeah. being, you know, productive other than just, you know, running the business and, um, you know, just being stuck in it, just, you know, kind of hamster wheel, if you will. So, uh, that's, that's what helped me was, uh, I developed a system called the Brokers Continuum, which breaks out uh, the business in four different departments. And then you can time block and schedule those departments. And that was also, you know, that was key for me to take, you know, my organization and effectiveness to the next level. And I didn't know this, but then also when I brought on a team and, you know, brought people on the team to help out, that same structure was vital to, you know, because it's pretty much like, hey, you have these four departments, what can be delegated? You know, so it's like, hey, this, you know, 90% of this quadrant is, you know, delegated and half of this one is. And then like all of a sudden I had, you know, 15, 20 hours of my week back. That is awesome, man. That's so cool. Yeah. So that's, it's, and like I said, it's one of those things that just came out of sheer pain. Yeah. Um, It's usually like necessity is the mother of all invention, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't want to feel that pain anymore. So, (laughs) uh, and, and for you, so on the operation side, 
uh, not to go too internal, but you know, with being able to provide so much, you know, uh, without giving us the proprietary formula, how do yeah. you how do you provide so much to brokers? Um, you know, kind of all across the board from a you know a full menu, while internally saying, you know, do you guys have departments like that, or do you say like, hey, each one of your uh, employees is trained on marketing, prospecting, or you, you know what I'm saying? So, so yeah. how do you, and I know it sounds like, you know, you're assigned a, a Digsy assistant. Um, so is it that one assistant that knows, you know, all different uh, departments of the business or you, you know, assign somebody special, you know, as a specialty for cold calling, somebody that's a special marketing. Specialty. Yeah. So, so basically I kind of like the operation. So we had built the listing service first, right? So that's yeah. easy. We, we pretty much like now it's just maintenance, et cetera. So I would say maybe like 10% of the time, of the developer, of our software developer's time has to be on that. Then we have internal tech to do the logistics for, uh, you know, for the photography and that stuff. So there is, for the photography uh, service, is basically independent um, photographers that we've hired and vetted that have worked with us throughout the year. So that took a couple years to build nationwide, but that, once you have that network, then, you know, you're only limited by the, by the volume of orders coming in. And that runs basically with two people. Right. Yeah. There's there's two people that handle these hundreds and hundreds of orders. A lot of it um, has been built out and there's a, a lot of room for efficiency there. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to the assistant service, we never started trying to build that. We didn't even have that idea. We just, it just became evident that people needed that. Yeah. Um, the way we started doing it at the beginning is we started hiring people and then it was like a client would hire them for this. We knew how to cold call and what questions to ask, and then we would train the person and, and bring them in and do that. Um, so there's people specialized in cold calling and sales development. There's people, and those same people need to know how to like research a property, go behind the LLC, find the contact behind the LLC, find the phone number, confirm. While they're calling the person to confirm, they can also see if they wanna sell or lease the building or blah, blah, blah. So it's yeah. kinda like a combination of con uh, research confirmation and a cold call. But then you have like marketing and graphics. Those people can't pick up the phone. Uh, yeah. They, they, you, you tell them to pick up the phone, they quit and they go work somewhere else where they don't have to talk to people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you have general admin, and a lot of the admins are comfortable with cold calling and and admin data entry, databasing, research, updating, scheduling, you know, calling brokers on surveys to confirm availability, tour schedule or tour instructions, right. blah 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 blah. That's right. a little bit easier, but you have to have those. So we started off like you know playing around with like hiring brand new people. When we switch our model, so as you can imagine, we get a client, it takes us like 14 days to 20 days to go from a signed contract to revenue, right? Because we train the person before they start working with the client. We don't want them, you know, training for the first two weeks. It right. just provides a, a bad user experience for the client, even though that's the way it's done, right? That's the way that it's done today. Like if we were to get hired at a company, that company pretty much like writes off that first month because it's just acclimation training and on ramp. Right. Um, what we did differently is we realized that we we have all these functions that digs it, right? We need yeah. social media marketing, we need email marketing, we need research because we have to find all the commercial real estate professionals that we're going to target. We need email addresses. We need people to call Augie and the rest of the SVN office say, hey, we work with hundreds of people at SVN. We don't work with hundreds of people at SVN. We have like maybe. I don't know, 30, 50, I don't know, um, throughout the US. But we need people calling, booking appointments, and we need somebody who's like an account executive, AKA kind of like a broker that knows how this whole thing works and can do that consulting call with the client and then take them and get them to sign a, an agreement with us to hire us. Then we also need you know, the graphics for the social media marketing, updating our marketing materials, create decks, presentations. And then we also need people who do admin stuff, like hey, help me or help operations, or help somebody else with their calendaring, databasing, updating stuff, et cetera. And we also have accounting functions. So we're like, fuck, why don't we just hire these people at Digsy? I mean, we're hiring salespeople at Digsy like every week. We just onboarded like, I don't know how many, right? That's awesome. So what we do is we wanna make sure that we don't lose the client and we retain them and we wanna make sure to produce results for the client. So we're mm -hmm. always hiring on sales development. Those are cold callers, cold emailers, call, talk to the prospect book a, 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 a discovery call with the interested party with one of our AEs or like higher level salespeople. Mm -hmm. So we need that. Well, those people after, you know, X amount of days, we see what their product, their production is. If they're not performing for Digsy, we let them go. Yeah. But then 
if they are producing well, and then Augie comes and hires us, hey, I need you to help me get more listings and tenant rep assignments, then I look and go, Alyssa is really damn good. And I go, Augie, okay, we're going to assign you Alyssa. We're going to write the script based on what our conversation was. We'll send it to you for approval. Let's jump in an uh, intro call with Alyssa. We think she's going to rock. And then basically within, instead of waiting 15 days, 20 days, or 30 days to go to revenue, we're in revenue within a few days. Yeah. No, that's that's really smart, man. That's a that's a that's an awesome way to on ramp and be efficient. In it's the, the same way that you said, though. Necessity is the mother of all invention, right? Yeah. It's like you know, pain makes you look for solutions, but that's how yeah. we come up with it. So that's the way it works now. Yeah. No, I love that, man. That's 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 really cool. So, in, in two questions for you, uh, one, you know, besides besides a CRM and say listing, uh, you know, a listing website, what what do you think is the number one piece of you know, technology software that brokers aren't using, or maybe you think is underrated, or you think is you know underrated, uh, or just undervalued in a broker's eyes, you know, today? That's a good question. Um, Other than Dixie, of course. No, oh, no, I mean, yeah, we're not gonna. I'm not gonna toot my own horn on here. I mean, I want to drive value for the audience, but yeah, yeah. Um. You know what? I, I, what I really believe, and this is like our number one acquisition channel, like number one, right? Besides referrals, is email. So I, I always, and you've seen me on LinkedIn, Augie. Like I'm always like harping and saying it in different ways that emails are gold. Yeah. They're absolutely gold. If you can yeah. build up a database of emails for buyers investors, tenant decision makers. Um, if you can do that and really, really hone in and really think about having like using that email uh, to to acquire business or stay in front of people, yeah, it's huge. And the reason why is one, email scalable. Uh, two, the tools today are better than, you know, putting somebody in an email address and in and, and an email marketing thing and blasting on a listing. Yeah. The tools today allow you to even hook up to your email, like your Outlook or your uh, Google Workspace, and send personalized emails at scale mm -hmm. that are basically sending in the background from your email. And if they, you can tell the software, if they don't respond in three days or five days or whatever, I want you to go and reply all to the initial email and say, hey, Augie, I would just want to follow up with this. Any interest in potentially selling your building? I'm working with a group of investors. If they don't yeah. respond to that, you can tell it, hey, in 15 days, do this. In 15 days, do that. Once it ends, you can go back in, add another follow-up on there, and go, here's our quarterly report. And then you can do. So you can use that list and do those kind of things. Yeah. That's a cool thing. So that yields results. That's, and that that's works really cool. for us. Yeah. But here's the beauty about email. It's what you can do. Email allows you to capture whether somebody opened the email. Yeah. It allows you to capture if they clicked. Yeah. How many clicks? Also, if you, instead of just attaching a PDF, if you do a trackable link that tracks the document mm -hmm. and tells you how much of the document was consumed, yeah. you're capturing that data. Yeah. And then if you're smart, and we have an internal tool here that we're, that we're building that allows us to score the leads, it goes, every time they perform this action, assign this number value to them. So let me put it to you this way. Let's say that you have a lot of our clients hire, hire Dixie assistants to not only cold call, but also collect email address. <laughs> and those SDRs, we call them sales development reps, are also running these email campaigns in the back. But then we're scoring the leads. So here's, here's what I mean. Let's say that my target prospect is a list of a thousand people mm -hmm. and I want to get a new listing. I can make a thousand calls will, will probably take me a week, mm -hmm. but only 1% is going to pick up, right? It's a very yeah. small number. Yeah. So that's like maybe a hundred people, you know, depending on how, li how big that list is or 10 people or whatever. Um, so that's really hard and a lot of work to go there. However, let's say I have that email, I put it in a sequencer, an email sequencer. It's yeah. sending, let's say, 300 emails a day. Within three days, three and a half days, that whole, everybody gets emailed. It automatically follows up. But then 
I tell the system, if they open the email, give me, uh, assign the value of one to them. If they click the link, assign a value of five to them. So that basically now that one turns into a six. Mm -hmm. If they click on the link and they view it, every time they consume 25% of that document, assign five points. So now that six is an 11. Mm -hmm. And if they keep on performing those actions, keep on adding to it. Yeah. So let's say I'm running this this campaign, right? Yeah. That it's basically just automating me having to write a bunch of emails and going and see who didn't respond. It's automatically detecting that and, and, and giving that. But now I'm collecting. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm I'm collecting data. That's the only reason for the email. Yeah, I stay in front of them, but I'm collecting data. So here's the thing that I mean. We run that campaign within three and a half days. The system tells me, hey, out of a hundred people, or a thousand people, these twenty people, the highest one has thirty points. The next one has 28 points. The next one, and it goes all the way down to like seven points. Yeah. Why would I spend a week calling a thousand people when the system's telling me that they're clicking on the survey of properties or they're clicking on my brochure or they're clicking on a BOV or whatever? To, if they're opening up that email and performing all those actions and they're doing it multiple times, nobody spends more than once on an email. Yeah. But now basically what you're doing is you're fishing with dynamite because you've sent an email. Obviously, they don't have time to talk or they haven't had a chance to call you, but you're able to collect that data. And this is why email is freaking gold. Yeah. It's absolutely gold. So you know what we do at Digsy to collect clients? All of our SDRs are um, emailing. They, they have these sequences going, but then there's a link to a brochure or whatever we're selling. And then basically what, what the system's doing is we're scoring it. And then when they get in the morning, they go after the people with the highest scores that they haven't called that day because we track, we have a system that allows them just to see what's important and they call. These guys are booking like per rep working only four hours a day. We only let, we only let our SDRs work four hours a day. Then in the afternoon, they're, they're paired up with a client or in the morning, they're paired up with a client. It just depends. They're booking five to eight meetings a week. Wow. Each yeah, contract yeah. that they that, that they generate is worth four thousand dollars. Wow, that's incredible, man! I think no, that was one of the things that I, I thought you would say. There was a couple of things, and that was one of them that I thought you would say. And I'm really glad you did because you went deeper on it. Even then, I've I've used email, so we implemented an email, you know, newsletter and a list, um, and emailing out property brochures. Um, but I definitely uh, picked up some gold through that. Which uh, so thank you. And also, you know, that's one of the things that I, you know, I talk to a, a lot of people about is, you know, the use of social media and, you know, and, and we talk <coughs> about emails and digital media because, you know, I'll see a lot of brokers spending a ton of time using, you know, making content and doing all these great things on, on social, which branding is always great. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but if you're trying to get listings, you need to get in the minds of your clients. And that's one thing is, you know, uh, at least my demographic, uh, they're usually older. So, you know, we, we specialize three to 12 million, three to $15 million sales. And, you know, that demographic is usually, uh, they're not on social media, definitely not on Instagram. Um, you know, probably not on LinkedIn, but you know, one thing they do is, uh, they, they check their mail and, you know, we can get mailing addresses obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we do send some direct mail. Uh, obviously we're calling, but they'll also check their email as well. And, um, and yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. And, um, no, that, that was really good, man. And last thing before we go, even though we could do a whole session on this, uh, what do you think, what do you, you know, uh, cause I, I know we only got a couple minutes here, but, uh, what do you think, you know, the open AI chat GPT, um, what do you think the, the biggest ways other than, you know, writing emails, because uh, I, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of people talk about, you know, in, in my research, I've dug into it. I've seen a lot about, and this could be in this version or the next version, because I think a lot of people are talking about, hey, what's it doing right here and now? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've seen a lot of people just stick uh, mainly to, uh, you know, saying uh, about like writing emails or, you know, writing up letters or whatever it is. Uh, so, you know, what do you think, how do you think that, you know, AI is going to affect commercial real estate as far as like a function like chat GPT goes, or what do you think is like the biggest way uh, beyond the stuff I just mentioned? Yeah, I think the staff is going to use it a lot. Like um, it, you, you can, you can literally customize chat GPT. You can train it. You, they don't have this functionality now, but this is what's on the horizon. And this is why uh, Microsoft grabbed ChatGPT, invested $10 billion on it. They're going to own over half of that company. Mm -hmm. 
that's the deal. They're going to get paid back their $10 billion, and they're going to go, they're going to own a huge percentage of the company, and they're already building it toward Microsoft Teams, et cetera. I think the staff's going to have a lot of it. Like, it's going to make it faster to write LOI. It's going to make it faster to write PSAs, blah, blah, blah. It's definitely going to disrupt contracts. Um, emails and things like that's great. Like, for example, right, we were just talking about email, right? A broker's going to sit there like, what should I write on my email? Right? Let's say I'm trying to get listings. Well, what's your approach going to be? How about I send this email instead of making it look like I'm marketing a property? I'm going to go, hey, Bob, I'm running with a group of investors looking for a property like yours. Would you have any interest in selling for the right price? Or you know, I can give you a free opinion of value, and then you can tell me then. But you don't know how to do that, or you don't want to have the time to do that. You can literally tell, hey, pretend you're a real estate expert, and you're trying write an email to you know write an email that basically asks the following things. And then it literally just creates it. You copy it, you tweak it if you want, you put it in your email, and now you don't have to think, like, what's my follow-up going to be? Write a follow-up to the, to the original email, boom, you just copy and paste, copy and paste. So then it'll eventually get to the broker where, like, the broker's now not having to think or come up with content, and it's well-researched in the back end. Uh, ChatGPT is great, but uh, yesterday was the announcement from Google that they did Bard, uh, which is basically the ChatGPT competitor, and guess what? ChatGPT's current version is running off, off, off data that's 24 months old. Google, right. it runs on real-time data. <laughs> they are like, the, they have so much access, so I think it's going to be a very fierce battle. Yeah. ChatGPT is also going to display some people, too. Like, I, I can definitely see, you know, I, we don't need two people uh, word processing. We only need one because ChatGPT is doing a lot yeah. of things. Uh, yeah. and things like that. So I think it's going to be huge. It's going to definitely augment. I can't see the brokers really actually long term. I don't think they're going like the eight, like the people who are actively selling and negotiating deals. They're not going to do that. But even even like, hey, I'm pissed off. How do I come up with a with with a, with, with a message or an email response to this that will help me get that free rent? And it can like definitely like use its intelligence to give you what you should respond to that person to try to negotiate that free rent on there. So it's going to be pretty cool. But I don't yeah. think it's going to be high adoption. I think it's mainly going to be operations that uses it a lot, not necessarily the agent. That's smart because, you know, that's one of the things um, that that's one of the things that I, I've been thinking about. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people are talking about it. And from the staff perspective is really good because, you know, I know, you know, the training that goes into your staff and, you know, that's the number one the number one thing that staff comes to me today is, you know, even when they're, you know, writing some copy or email or uh, emailing something back to a client, uh, you know, it's after six, you know, seven, eight months or so, uh, they can get a much better flow of, you know, like say my tone or conversation uh, and just how to talk commercial real estate, but there's still higher level things that, uh, you know, they're not fully comfortable with. So, you know, any tool to make them more comfortable, uh, you know, with, any of those things, I think is going to be big. So, uh, and, and yeah, you, go ahead. Have you heard of this uh, sales uh, and AI writing assistant called Lavender AI? I have not. Dude, check it out. It's All freaking right. wild. It hooks into your Gmail and, or it hooks into your Outlook. And when you're writing like an email, like a prospecting email or you're doing anything, it literally uses all this data and like also tells you, hey, you need to split up these sentences. This is redundant. You should say this. And by the way, it scores it. It goes, this is going to get a reply. This is not going to get a reply. It basically uses intelligence like across everything in sales to make sure that you get a reply to that. It's, it's freaking bonkers, dude. That, that's it, cool. It, so it, we use it internally. Like We just started using it this past week and I'm blown away. All right. by the I'm going to check it out today because I'm a big Grammarly fan because, uh, you know, it's a like Grammarly for making money. Yeah. It's a, it's, it sounds like a, a, a Grammarly for sales, which, yeah. um, I know I love that. And I think that's great. And even, yeah, like with uh, chat GPT, you know, it's like, Hey, coming, you know, being comfortable with what you're putting out there as far as, you know, scripts or emails or whatever it is. Uh, no, I think that's great. And, and yep. if it can think through, you know, persuasive style metrics and how to get responses and, you know, That's what it's doing. Um, yeah, it's scary. You know, good. Because I, I think all the time of like, when I write an email and like, I want a response from somebody, mm -hmm. I'll like change the last word, you know, like, uh, or even when it, where it says, thank you in my uh, email signature, thank you. And then like my email, email signature below it, 
sometimes I'll change it to talk soon or, uh, or, or something else because, yeah. or just the last line above that. It's like, Hey, if we want a response from this person, um, you know, what, uh, you know, how can, how can we, uh, how can we change the verbiage? So, Oh, there's a hack on that, that we learned when, we, when I was working with sales and marketing leaders here, cause we were trying to, I like, Hey, what can we do? You always want to over optimize sales because you know, any incremental sale, is just gets you more and more and more money. Right. One thing that we found out was um, what you're talking about is a call to action. Like if you're trying to elicit a response, have like a call to action there. Like, hey, yeah, can yeah. you get back to me? It's just like, can you get back to me? You go, can you get back to me by 3 p.m., please? Question mark. Yeah. <laughs> right? But then what we started doing is we bold that that sentence and that just made, makes a huge difference on getting I, a response. I have used, used uh, bolds and underlines before, especially, you know, if there's multiple people on the email chain, it's like, Hey, this is, you know, here's this email. There's, you know, don't want to say it's fluff, but like, here's my main point right here. And like, that's what I need response yeah. back to. And that's yeah. what we're, we're, we're trying to move forward. So it works uh, yeah. solid. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's awesome, man. So, uh, and, and before we go, you know, if you, if you just tell us, man, what, you know, in the next, you know, say three to five years, um, I know Digsy, you guys got a lot of really cool stuff going on there. So, uh, what does it look like, you know, for you, for Digsy in the next, you know, three to five years, like, what are you looking forward to? What are you working on that you can share and, uh, what should the people look out for? Yeah. I mean, right now we, we're growing at a pretty, at a, at a double digit clip, which is awesome. Uh, is the company. So yeah, we're trying to, you know, like really we want to, we want to get to, you know, a look, a multi-million dollar company, um, you know, in the next, uh, couple of years or the next year, really. Yeah. But, uh, for Digsy is we're going to start, uh, as this more AI starts, you know, coming to fruition, we see the consistent use cases that can be applicable to our target demographic, which is commercial real estate professionals. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to be deploying that there's going to be some automation tools and intelligence tools that we're considering to roll out. For example, the lead scoring tool that we use internally that we had to build. Yeah. Or we're actually, it's like a work in progress because we keep at, I keep adding to it with a team. Um, I think those are going to be pretty damn cool uh, to yeah. do that. But that's all I can share at this moment. And then, yeah. you know, you can always, if, if you're curious about us, you can always go to getdigsy.com. So G E T D I G S Y.com. Yeah. You can go to products and see everything that we offer. Uh, and, you know, if anybody wants to connect with me, they can find me, Andrew Bermudez. So B E R M U D E Z. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, you know, the usual places yeah. where you can just, you know, email me directly, you know, Andrew at get .com And, you know, I'm always happy to help. Yeah, man, that's awesome. Well, I really appreciate you spending time with us. Uh, I think this has been really beneficial. I know to me personally, but also uh, to the audience. So this is great to have somebody. We've had a lot of very successful and awesome people on the show. Uh, not enough tech people, though. Um, you know, it's, it's what's uh, moving the industry forward at a double digit, uh, you know, pace. And there's a lot of cool things coming out. Uh, which Digsy is one of. So, uh, man, once again, just thank you so much. And uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you on the next episode.